And we'll start by a problem about setting up integrals. So it says, rewrite the following as a single integral. See, right now it's, it's the sum of two integrals. And so it says, let's put it together. Let's, let's come together. So what do we have? We have the integral 0 to 1, 0 to 1, 0 to 1 minus y squared of some function, dz dy dx, and 0 to 1, negative 1 to 0, 0 to y plus 1. Again, it's the same function, but dx dy dz. So it's not just as simple as sort of, oh, hey, let's get the endpoints to match. Well, I mean, the, the picture's going to probably be more complicated. That's OK. We like things which are more interesting. Maybe we shouldn't say more complicated, more interesting, more interesting. Now, as always, we know that the integrals match up with the ends. So for example, the innermost integral sign matches up with the innermost variable, and so forth and so on. So because of this, we can go through and, and figure out where these integrals are at. So let's spend some time on the first integral. So starting from the outside, we see that x goes between 0 and 1, y goes between 0 and 1, and then z goes from 0 to 1 minus y squared. And really what's happening here is that the bounds are describing our region by a series of inequalities. And so once you understand that, you can say, okay, if I have a set of integrals, I can extract what it looks like by just figuring out what's the series of inequalities and then building things up. Now, if we label our picture, as we probably should at some point, say x, y, z, what do we have? Well, if we look at the first one, 0 to 1, that's pretty straightforward. x goes from 0 to 1. Add another layer. y also goes from 0 to 1. So what that means here is that in terms of x, y, so I can think of my first two layers, outer layers, as being the x, y plane. And that would correspond to a square down here. Okay. So that's 0 to 1 for x, 0 to 1 for y, get a nice square. Now where does z go from? Well, it goes from 0, which is the xy plane. So I'm going to start on the xy plane, and I'm going up to 1 minus y squared. Now, this is a surface, it's not a curve. But it looks like, it feels like a curve, because we see z equals 1 minus y squared, we only see two things. We see y and z. So we think to ourselves, what would this look like in the yz plane? Well, what would it look like in the yz plane? What would you see? Upside down parabola. So what you would see in the yz plane, and we can see the yz plane, it's right back here. It's an upside down parabola. The intercept is at 1. So I go up by 1. And so I go down, and it just so happens when I hit y equals 1, z equals 0. So I get something that looks like that. Now, that's in the yz plane, but remember, it's a three-dimensional figure. So how does it go to three dimensions? The answer is, it copies itself. So I'm just going to take a copy of this curve backwards and forwards. All right, and so what happens? And you'll notice I'm only drawing the part that's going to be above my region here. All right, so I'm just going to copy this curve backwards and forwards. And I get that shape. And so there's our, our first region. OK. So here we go. All right. Yes? Yeah. It's, it's somewhat akin to we took like a, a square and then we sort of sanded off, well, not a square, a cube, and sanded off a corner. Now I'm going to point something out here, which is when we go into our most inner layer, we're integrating with respect to z. So that this integral right here, the last integral, we're going from a point up to the curved face. OK, so that's that integral. Now we'll go to our second integral. So in our second integral, well, what do we have? Well, we have the following. 
We read off the inequalities. Now our outermost variable is z. So z goes from 0 to 1. y then goes from negative 1 to 0. And x, well, that goes from 0 up to y plus 1. All right. So if z goes from 0 to 1 and y goes from negative 1 to 0, well, that's describing a region in the yz plane. And what's that region? Well, OK, so we go over negative 1 for y, we go up 1 for z, and we get this square. So this square is the first two inequalities. Now what happens? Well, x, we're going to go from 0 up to y plus 1. So what does the curve x equal y plus 1 look like? Well, actually, I, I misspoke. What does the surface x equal y plus 1 look like? But OK, let's suppose we go back to a curve. It looks like it's in the xy plane. So if you graph x equals y plus 1, what do you see? What kind of shape is it? Line. It's a line. So it's a line. Now, we can figure out a couple of things. Uh, for instance, when y equals negative 1, what is true about x? Zero. It's 0, which means that in terms of the xy plane, it's going to hit that point where y equals negative 1 and x equals 0. When y equals 0, what is x? It's 1, so it's going to hit this point right here. Now you might say, well, why are you picking negative 1 and 0 for y? Well, because that's where y goes between. y goes between negative 1 and 0. So I'm picking those endpoints so I can see what happens. So what's going to form here is a straight line. But of course, we do what we did before, which was we just make a straight line. And so our surface, x equals y plus 1, it's this plane here. So what we get is we get a, a shape like we took a cube and we saw it exactly in half. So there's our, our second shape. OK? So now we have our, our two shapes nailed down. Those are our two integrals. And we can see that they fit nicely together. And I should also, I suppose, in the last one, say the last integral was with respect to x. And so that means we're moving in the x direction. So we went from the back face and we went parallel to we hit the front face. So the, the first integral went up and down in the last part. The la second integral went sort of back and forth. Now we have to decide What's a good order for integration to get a single integral? Well, could it be up and down? Well, no, because there's an issue with up and down. Why do I say there's an issue? Well, suppose I went up and down and I came over here. You'll notice that on the bottom, we always are coming off the xy plane. But what happens on the top? For part of our region, we're this curved face. But for a different part, we're this flat face. So if we were trying to go up and down the whole way, we have to change surfaces. Now, if you change a surface, that's a break in your integral. And that means you have to do more than one integral. So we can't have our innermost layer be with respect to z. That would be going up and down. So innermost layer being dz is out. How about innermost layer being dx? This sort of back and forth. Well, come over here, and we do back and forth. And what do we see? Well, in the back side, it's always the yz plane. Life is good. But on the front side, here on the left, it's a slanted face. On the right, it's a flat face. Well, that means we're changing our surfaces. Now, if we change the surface, that's a break in the integral, which means we can't do it as one integral, which means that whatever integral we set up can't have dx as the innermost layer. OK, so we can't have dz. We can't have dx. Well, what could we possibly have? dy. OK, so let's think about dy. Well, where does dy say? dy says you're going parallel to y. So we're going to be going left and right. Now the question is, as we move left and right, 
do we always hit consistently the same surfaces? And the answer is, yeah. We're going to hit this surface on the back side and this curved surface on the front side. So, if our innermost layer is dy, life is good. So we're going to do an integral, 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 f of x, y, z, dy. Now, let's be looking down the y-axis. Because if, if my innermost layer is dy, then I have to decide what these are, but we'll figure that out in a second. I look down the y-axis, so that says I'm looking, I see something in the xz plane, the y-axis has become a point. What shape do I see? Square. I see a square. In particular, I see this square where the two things glue together. So what I'm seeing is a one by one square. All right, so when I'm setting up my outer two layers, that's my region I have to set up. Well, the good news is squares are easier to set up. Do you want to do dx dz or dz dx? dx dz, okay. So, first if we integrate with respect to z, where does z go between? Yeah, between 0 and 1. Now, given that we know z, we say, okay, where does x go between? Well, where does x go between? 0 and 1. Yeah, squares are easy to set up bounds for. All right, now our innermost layer. We've got to get our surfaces. And these have to be surfaces in terms of y. So we've got to go back for a second and talk about these surfaces. Now this slanted surface over here, that came from the surface z equals 1 minus y squared. Now I can't put z equals 1 minus y squared because I need a y equals something. So we need to solve for y. y squared is 1 minus z. Then y is either plus or minus the square root of 1 minus z. Do I need the plus or do I need the minus? And, and how do I know? I need the plus because these are positive y values. If I had the minus, I'd have negative y values. So that is one of my surfaces. My other surface came from on the other side, and that was from the, the plane. This was the x equals y plus 1. But again, I need to get in terms of y equals something. So how can I solve for y? What does it become? x minus 1. Subtract 1. OK, so finally, where do we go from? From where to where? Which one of these is the top and which one of these is the bottom? x minus 1 is on the bottom. Square root of 1 minus z is on the top. And how do we know? Well, we go from lower value to higher value. So low values for y are to the left. High values for y are to the right. Left to right. And now we're done. Woohoo! That was fun. I like this problem. I like this problem. All right. Any questions? Okay, good, good. So that means you're ready. If you see it on an exam, no problems, no problems. So we're talking about integration. And of course, we really should have started by saying, why? Why integration? I mean, sure, we can do that, but why do we want to do it? And the reason we want to do integration is because there's applications involved. So we're going to be talking about applications today, and we're going to be talking about applications next time. So what is the goal when we talk about integration? Well, the basic idea is saying, I'm looking for something. In particular, I'm looking for a total of something. Now, the question is a total what? Well, it depends on the problem. So I have to think about that. But uh, I might be looking for a total area. I might be looking for a total volume. I might be looking for a total mass. or or some other such thing. But how do we do it? The idea is always the same. Take what you're looking for, break it down into little parts, 
And when you're breaking the parts, make sure the parts are nice. And by nice, we mean basically flat. Or a better way to say it is fairly constant. Easy to understand. Figure out what's happening with the parts and put them all together. Now, we have some geometrical applications that we've already done. One of the things we started with with integration says, if I want to find the area of a region, all I need to do is integrate 1 over that area. And I get the number. If I want to find volume, we didn't say it explicitly, but we can go ahead and just say it right now. If I have a shape, if I want to find the volume, I can just integrate 1 dv, and that finds the volume of my shape. And the intuition is the same as with area, because what happens is the dv says, break things up into little tiny pieces. And the dv is how much volume is in that little tiny piece. So what's the contribution from that little tiny piece when you integrate 1? Well, the answer is the contribution is just that amount of volume in that part. But now you add all the parts together, that's the total volume. Well, we can also do volume when we're looking between curves. So if I have two surfaces, one surface over another surface, and I want to say, what's the volume between the surfaces? Well, what we do is we look at the height. So g of xy minus f of xy is just a fancy way of saying height. So if you integrate height dA, and if you think about it, it makes sense. Because the height, I can think of as a measurement, a one-dimensional measurement. dA, I can think of as like a two-dimensional measurement. If I multiply a one-dimensional by a two-dimensional, I'll get up to a three-dimensional measurement, which means that I'm really breaking this up into little pieces of volume, and then I'm adding the little pieces of volume together. Now, sometimes if we're looking for volume between surfaces, we may not explicitly state the region. And if that's the case, what do we do? Well, we look at where the, the two surfaces intersect, and that will tell us where our region should be. Well, we want to do an application that's maybe not so obvious. How does it start? Which is surface area. All right, so we have this surface, z equals f of xy, and we're over some region r. And the question is, how much area is there in that surface? Now, this is a tricky problem because we have to think, well, how do we, how do we approximate it? Well, the idea is we say, let's look over a small piece of R. So this is not all of R. This is really a small piece of R. And here's a, a piece of that surface. And if you look at that surface, you can say, when I look at a small piece, it looks fairly flat. Now, what I've done on the right side here is I've taken something which doesn't just look flat. I've taken something which actually is flat. Now, what is that blue thing here? Well, that's the tangent plane. So I took the tangent plane at the corner, and I just put it right on top. Now, what's true about our tangent plane compared to our surface? Locally, they're good approximators. So that when I look at a small piece, they're basically indistinguishable. So we have our sort of aha moment. So what we can do is we say, we're going to take our, our tangent plane. We also call that our linearization, which is our flat thing. There's our flat thing. And we're going to say, how much area is there for the tangent plane over that part? Well, that's a really good estimate for how much surface area there is over that part. And how do we get a better estimate? Well, you just make your pieces smaller. And that's the idea of integration. If you make things smaller, your estimates get better, and so you're approaching the correct value. All right. Well, I mean, in principle, that's a good idea. But how does it actually work? Well, so we need to know a couple of things. So let's stare a little bit more at this and think about what's true. Well, suppose I have a shape down here. I'm breaking it up. And when we break things up, we oftentimes think about breaking things up. So I have my little change in x and a little change in y. So I get a, a rectangle up here. What kind of shape do we see upstairs? Rectangle. It's kind of like a rectangle, but because of the tilt, what could happen is it could slightly warp. 
So it's almost a rectangle. What's certainly true is that this side and that side have to be parallel because they're sitting over parallel sides. And this side on the back has to be parallel to that side on the front. It's a parallelogram. Now, remember what we're after. We're after area. Well, is there anything that helps us find area of a parallelogram? Does anything cross your mind? Cross product. Okay. So, the area of a parallelogram, when the vectors that are the sides are u and v, is you take the cross product of u and v, and you take the magnitude. So, what happens? Well, our tangent plane is delta z is f sub x delta x plus f sub y delta y. That's just our sort of generic way to write down what a tangent plane does. So what are the two vectors that are the sides? Well, what we want to do is we want to say, well, one vector is when we say nothing happens in the y direction, so that part doesn't change. And then we say, okay, we have a bit of change in x, and then the change in z is f sub x change in x. The other thing is we say, okay, there's, we cover up the, the delta x, there's no change in the x direction, and everything comes from y. So there's no change in x, there's a change in y, and then the change in z is f sub y delta y. These are our two vectors. We take the cross product, we very patiently work it through, and it's not so bad, and we get the following. So there's uh, no real big surprises here. We're taking the cross product of our two vectors that are the sides. In the first vector, the terms have delta x in common, so we can pull it out. The second, they have delta y in common, pull it out. This vector, you sit down, you do the cross product. You can check yourself later on. And then you take the magnitude. So that's the, the piece, or the area, that's approximating one little piece. Now, we add them up. So the surface area is approximately the sum when we add all these things together. So one, square root of 1 plus f sub x squared plus f sub y squared delta a. But of course, we now take smaller and smaller pieces, and we get the following formula. So the surface area, it's the integral over our region, the square root of 1 plus f sub x squared plus f sub y squared dA. Now, one thing you might think about is you might think back to Calc 2. Ah, oh, the good old days of Calc 2. And one of the things we learned in Calc 2, in fact, we even did it in this semester a little bit, was arc length. So if you remember arc length, it's, it's good to compare arc length formula. That was the integral over whatever your interval was, square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. And if you look, it, it kind of has that same feel to it. So it feels like the right kind of thing, because it is the right thing. All right. Now, a couple of notes. This actual integral is very hard to do except in a few special cases. Which means that you're probably only ever going to be asked to explicitly do it in a few special cases. So that, that's the good news. Uh, you could, of course, be asked to set it up. So we're going to work on being able to set things up. But, uh, well, we should at least do one special case. Find the surface area of the saddle. So remember, that's a thing that looks a little bit like a Pringle chip. Z equals x squared minus y squared over the unit circle. OK. So the nice thing is, we have the formula. So the unit circle, this is our region R. And this x squared minus y squared, this is our function f of x, y. So according to the formula, surface area is the integral over our region of the square root of 1 plus what is the derivative of f with respect to x? 2x. So 2x squared plus 
what's the derivative of f with respect to y? Negative 2y squared, and then dA. So, we have to find the following integral. Well, notice the squaring definitely gets rid of the negative. That's a little bit looking up. But if you look at this, you got 4x squared and 4y squared. You could just sort of pull out a 4. Right, this is x squared plus y squared dA. How can we go about actually doing this integral? Now, we could do it by making our life miserable and trying to do some sort of weird, crazy trig substitution and then filling up pages and pages of scratch work before we give up. Or, what else could we do? Polar. What's suggesting polar about this problem? Yeah, the fact that you see that x squared plus y squared is very polar-like, but there's something else that suggests polar. What else? Unit circle. Ah, the unit circle, that loves polar. See, in polar, the unit circle very nice, because that becomes theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, and r goes from 0 out to 1. So, setting this up in polar, we'll get uh, integral, integral, square root of, what does this become? 1 plus 4r squared. Okay, dA becomes r dr d theta, and the bounds. Well, we see the bounds. 0 to 2 pi, and 0 to 1. Now, we of course are at the point in our calculus journey where we know that the square root of 1 plus 4r squared is not just 1 plus 2r. Because that was a long time ago. We've gone way past that. We know we have to be more careful. All right. Well, one of the things we can do is we can actually break this up into two pieces. Because if you look at the bounds, they're nice bounds in that there's numbers, just numbers, numbers. And we can break our integral up and say, well, what's the theta part? And the answer is just the d theta. And then what's the r part? Well, 0 to 1 squared of 1 plus 4r squared r dr. So this first integral, that's not so bad. What do you get? 2 pi. Okay, because, you know, you're integrating... 1, uh, you get theta, evaluate from 0 to 2 pi, uh, you get 2 pi. Now, for the second integral, what do we do? Substitution, what do we substitute? Yeah, probably we should just substitute the whole inside. 1 plus 4r squared. What would du become? 8r dr. And we're just going to divide both sides by 8. So 1 8th times du is r dr. So this integral would become square root of u, which we write as u to the 1 half. r dr becomes 1 8th du. And the bounds, well, the old bounds were 0 to 1, but these are r bounds. So even though we don't write it down, we know that these are associated with r because it's associated with the dr. Our new bounds are going to be u bounds. So if r is 0, what does u equal? 1. If r is 1, what does u equal? 5. So we get 1 eighth. Uh, the integral of u to the 1 half is u to what power? 3 halves. And then in front we put 2 thirds. Evaluate from 1 to 5. So we can do a little bit of cancellation. So that would be 1 12th, 5 to the 3 halves, and then minus 1. Now, this is not our final answer because there's also the 2 pi. See, that this is just the part for the second integral. So our real final answer is we multiply the 2 pi times 1 12th, 5 to the 3 halves minus 1, giving us pi over 6, 5 to the 3 halves, minus 1. And that's the answer. All right. Good. And that is almost the only one we can do. There's actually a second one we can do. Well, there's three of them we can do. We're saving some for the quiz, so, you know, can't do it all today. So, so the next one. 
Set up but do not evaluate in integral. Define the surface area over the region where y is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 2 minus y squared for the function f of x, y equals, and let's just pick a simple function. Anybody have a favorite function? <laughs> let's pick something more interesting that's not flat. X plus 2. X plus 2 is still flat. Okay. X squared plus 2. <laughs> All right. That's a sign from the heavens. They're not happy with that one. But, all right, we'll go with x squared plus 2. It's not flat. Uh, uh, all right. Okay, so where do we go? Well, uh, okay, we need a y in there. We need a y. x squared plus 2y cubed. Okay, got to have something. Got to have something. Got to have a little bit of meat to this problem. Okay, so... All right, so we have our function, and now it's not so hard to really set up the, the, the problem. I think this problem, we, though, is let's work on the bounds. What are our bounds? That's probably going to be one that takes a little bit longer. Okay, so let's talk about our bounding curves. Uh, y equals x. That's not so bad. That looks like y equals x. So I'm in... This is not a three-dimensional picture. This is just the x, y plane. I'm trying to get a, a handle on my bounds. 2 minus y squared. What does that look like? Well, what's the shape? Let's just start with that. It's a parabola. What way? Up? Down? Left? Right? It's left. So there's 2. So when you have x as y squared, that's a parabola that's opening either left or right. So x equals y squared would be the parabola that opens in this way. The minus y squared flips it, so it opens to the left. Then the 2 shifts it over. So it's doing this. Now, we need this, something where we're to the right of this line, y equals x, and to the left of 2 minus y squared, which means our region is this piece. So we have to describe this region in terms of x and y. Now, the good news is we actually have something really nice going for us. Because we're told we have the inequality, y less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 2 minus y squared. So, that would work well if we could figure out where does y go between, because if we had that, that would be our, our region described as a set of inequalities. So to do that, we have to figure out, okay, where does y go between? We need to figure out these points. So how do you figure out where these points are at? Sorry, what? Intersections, yeah. So, where does y equal 2 minus y squared. Well, that's the same as asking when does y squared plus y minus 2 equal 0? And we hope it factors. Do you think it factors? Of course it factors. Come on. It's calc. Everything factors. Almost. y plus 2 and y minus 1. So where are the intersections at? y equals negative 2 and y equals positive 1. So that tells us where y goes between, and now we're done. That's our region described as a series of inequalities. <coughs> so if we use that description, and we should, because if we wanted to change it, see, currently it's, it's integrating in this fashion, horizontal slicing. If we were to switch to vertical slicing, we'd have to do two integrals, and that sounds like twice as much work. So we're going to avoid that. All right, are we integrating dx dy or dy dx? Well, the question is, what's this doing? It's, it's a dx dy description, where the outermost layer is going between numbers, and then the inner is going between curves. So we can now read it off. We know that y goes from negative 2 to 1, and we know that x, sorry, that x yeah, goes from y, to 2 minus y squared. So there's our setup. And we're doing the surface area, because it says do the surface area. So that's the square root of 
1 plus, and now we come to our function and say, okay, what's the root of this function with respect to x? 2x. And then you square that. Plus, now what's the root with respect to y? 6y squared. And then you square that. And now what do you do? And you stop. Because you're done. Because this is about setting things up. And we set it up. Okay. Set up, but do not evaluate an integral to find the surface, over, surface area over the region where theta goes between 0 and pi, r goes between 0 and 3, for the surface, z equals r cubed sine of theta. So this is the surface in cylindrical coordinates. So if you give me an r and theta, I can tell you what z should be. And it's perfectly fine to describe things in different coordinate systems. Coordinate systems are all about descriptions, and there's more than one way to describe things. So, what do we do? Well, we have to pause and say, huh. We go back and look at our formula and say, that's not feeling very cylindrically. It feels very Cartesian-y. And it is. It is very Cartesian-like. So we can't just sort of say, oh, I'll take f sub r and f sub theta. Our formula was set up, built off the idea of these uh, parallelograms. So we really need to make sure we're working in the right coordinate system in order to use the formula. So we have to be careful. So what choice do we have? We're going to switch to Cartesian. So what does this become? Well, if we look at r cubed sine theta, we can break it as r squared times r sine theta. Now, the reason that that's more natural than it might look at first glance is we say, OK, when we're going between Cartesian and, say, polar, we know that r sine theta has a nice form. So since I see a sine theta, I want to attach an r to it. And then I'll see what's left over. So when we do this, what does r squared become? x squared plus y squared. And what does r sine theta become? Well, the reason I'm asking why is, oh, no, no, no. It's x squared y plus y cubed. OK, so this is going to be the function where we can apply the formula to. So we can say the following. Our surface area is the integral over our region of the square root of 1 plus, and this part is our f of x, y, f sub x squared. What is f sub x squared? 2x, y squared plus f sub y. What is that? x squared plus 3y squared squared dA. Okay, so that's on our way. Now we have two choices. One choice is we can keep it in Cartesian and put our region into Cartesian, because right now it's in polar. The second choice is we can swap back and say, let's put our function back into polar. Which one do you prefer? Put our region in terms of Cartesian? Okay. So let's talk about our region. There's a Well, theta goes between 0 and pi, which means that we're going to go in the top half here. So we're somewhere in the top half. And then r is doing what? Well, we're going from 0 out to 3. Now, r equals 3 is a circle with radius 3. And if we're going from 0 to 3, that just says as we swing out, we're just going to keep going out to the edge. So our region is the top half of a circle of radius 3. So if we're switching to Cartesian, we need to figure out these things, how to describe it. Well, I would say let's go first integrate with, uh, if, well, my, my inclination is to say the following. Let's write this top curve y as a function of x. Now it's the circle of radius 3 
So this becomes x squared plus y squared equals 9. So y squared is 9 minus x squared, and it's the top half, so it's the positive square root. So for this region, the easiest thing to do is, is to do our vertical slicing, just because I like to have these zeros on, on the denominator. And if we do that, we'll have negative 3 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to positive 3, and then 0 less than or equal to y, less than or equal to the square root of 9 minus x squared. So that our surface area, when we actually put in our bounds as well, x goes from negative 3 to positive 3, y goes from 0 to the square root of 9 minus x squared, the square root of 1 plus 2xy quantity squared plus x squared plus 3y squared quantity squared, and dA becomes what? dy dx because the outer layer is x bounds and the inner layer is y bounds. Okay, so there we go. Now, that's our surface area. So we can do things. We can find areas, we can find volumes, we can find surface area. And we are going to come back and visit surface area quite a bit at the end of the class. And when I say the end of the class, I mean three, four weeks from now. All right, so the other topic we want to talk about today is mass. So we're getting into physics. And we're going to do a lot of physics applications as well tomorrow. So when I have a region, it can be a two-dimensional region or a three-dimensional region. We could even make a one-dimensional region. We did that when we were doing Calc 2, when we had, had wires. But OK, so we have this region. We can assign densities to our region. And now we can start to ask the question, OK, how much mass is there? Because the density is telling us locally the concentration of mass, how much mass there is in that particular region, given an amount of area. So we say, all right, I understand how mass works in a small part. Because I take whatever the density is at a location, multiply it by the area or the volume, depending upon whether I'm two-dimensionals or, or three-dimensions. And I say, OK, I can find the mass of a little piece, and then I could add the little parts together. This sounds like integration, because it's integration. So we break things up into small parts. That's our delta A. Multiply that small part by the amount of density there. If we take density times area, that produces the mass. So you should think of this little piece here as the mass of a small part. So in other words, when you have that density times delta A, that's our mass of a small part. And then we're going to add all the parts together. And so that becomes, in the limit, as we let things get small, the integral over our region, density dA. So again. It's when you multiply density times the dA, that's when you get mass. It's the mass of that small piece. And then the double integral says we're just adding all the pieces up. There's nothing special about two dimensions, though. Same philosophy, same idea works in three dimensions. So we can say that the mass of a solid is you integrate over the solid, the local density times dV. All right, so let's do a problem. Now, you might remember that we've actually done problems kind of in the same spirit as what we're talking about right now, which is to say we found the mass of two-dimensional regions. But when we did it before, we were like, well, we have to make sure we work with, with density functions which are really, really specialized, which, in other words, they only vary with one variable. They can only vary with x or they can only vary with y. That's what we did back in Calc 2, back in our lonely single variable calculus days. But now we're multivariable. And so we're able to handle more complicated things. So let's find the mass for the region. y squared less than or equal to x less than or equal to 1. And the density of xy is xy squared. What does our region look like? 
Well, one bounding curve is x equals 1. That's not so hard to draw. Let me switch colors here. Because sometimes when you have the same color, these vertical lines look a lot like the coordinate line. So here's the x equals 1. How about x equals y squared? What is that? It's a sideways parabola. So here's the x equals y squared. And we want to go from y squared on the left to 1 on the right. So that tells us that our region is this piece right here. And we can see something that's happening. We can see a couple things. First off, because our density is x, y squared, the further we move to the right, the more dense we get, because x moves up as we move to the right. We can also see, because of the y squared, that as we move away from the y-axis, again, we increase. So what's happening is that we actually tend to be more dense up here towards these corners, and we tend to be less dense here, for example, near the origin. Okay, so this is something where I, I have my density varying both with x and y. So, what do we do? Well, the mass is going to be the integral over our region of our density dA. And you might say, how did you know that? I copied it. It was over here. Okay, so all right, but, but essentially, you know, that's the philosophy. If I want mass, I integrate density. And now we start filling in our pieces. All right, the density, well, that's given to us, x, y squared. How should we integrate, dx, dy, or dy, dx? In other words, vertical or horizontal? I think, looking at it, it seems really well suited for horizontal, which is dx, dy. Well, where does y go from? So we have to figure out where, where are these intersections happening. In other words, when does y squared equal 1? Well, y squared equals 1 at 1. Anywhere else? Negative, negative 1. So y goes from negative 1 to positive 1, the intersection points. Where does x go from? Well, it actually says it right here. See, these are like bounds. It says that x goes from y squared to 1. Now, this is not an integral where you can pull apart because you notice that we have a variable here in, in that y squared. So we've got to do it one layer at a time. That's okay. It's good to do this. Integral of x, y squared with respect to x. A half x squared, y squared, evaluated from x equals y squared to x equals 1. Okay, so evaluate. That would be 1 half x squared times 1, so that's a half x squared minus a half, whoops, a half y squared. Ah, okay, that was always a y. All right, a half y squared. When you plug in x equals y squared, y squared squared times another y squared gives us y to what power? Six. Because Six. remember, there's y squared squared plus another y squared. Okay, dy. Now, here we can save ourselves a little bit of work. Notice this function is even. And so instead of going from negative 1 to 1, we can just double going from 0 to 1. Yes? No? OK, I'm going to say yes, because we're almost out of time. And so the halves and the twos all cancel. So we're going to get 1 third y cubed minus 1 seventh y to the seventh. Evaluate that from 0 to 1, which is 1 third minus 1 seventh. And if you, if you put these together, you get 7 over 21 minus 3 over 21, which is 4 over 21. Now, before you run away, let's ask ourselves a quick question. Is this at least reasonable? Yeah, I mean, we don't expect it to be a huge number. It's not very large density. It's not a very big region. If we had gone a negative number, would that have been reasonable? No! We'd go back and we'd check our work, because math should not be negative. There's no anti-mass. And so now we're into applications. Make sure your answer is reasonable. So let's do an example now with uh, something three-dimensional. Right, because we've done two-dimensional. It kind of feels very, you know, calculus 2 -y when we do two dimensions. Let's try to do something three-dimensional. So, so S is a solid. Okay, 
So what is the solid? Well, it's a solid that's below z equals 2. So if we were to sketch that part, that's not so bad to sketch. So z equals 2. That's sitting up here. z equals 2. It's a, a plane. It's like the xy plane, but you just moved it up by 2. And we're above the planes z equals 2x, z equals minus 2x, z equals 2y, and z equals minus 2y. Now suppose, let's just focus for a second on, on just these two. So we're above z equals 2x and z equals minus 2x. Well, what that means is if you were to look here in the x, z plane, z equals 2x would look like this, and z equals minus 2x would look like that, which means we want to be above both of them, so we're, we're looking like this shape here. Now, if we were to go and introduce a third dimension, so for example, say we put y along here, what we would be forming is we'd be forming something that looks like a, a trough. So we're forming this sort of trough shape, moving backwards and forwards. And we want it to be like, well, we're inside the trough. That's where we're at. We're, in, we're inside this trough here. Okay? So that's when we look at just that part. But of course, when we look at this part, we're in, a, we're in another trough that runs perpendicular. So what's the shape? Well, the answer is it looks like an upside down pyramid. Oh, that's good. We don't even have to guess. And if you think about it, well, what does that mean? It means that you can imagine taking this sort of a, a square up here. Let's, let's say this is a square here. And we just connect our corners down. Okay. There's our, there's our shape, our solid, our, our upside down pyramid. Now, uh, for this shape, we're given the density function delta f x y z is 9 plus arctangent x to the fifth y squared times z. And uh, we, have to, we have to find the total mass. Now, looking at this, we have to make a choice. Now, there's a hint here given to us which says, hint, dx, dy, dz. Now, that's a pretty solid hint. So we're going to go in that direction. But let's think of for a second, why would we not want to integrate where we would have dz first? So why do we not want dz dy dx? Because, you know, we've said in the past, that's the way we were raised. We were raised in a dz dy dx environment. Well, suppose for a minute we were to take this shape and look at it from above. And, and let's suppose not only are we looking at it from above, but we have somewhat of x-ray glasses as we look at it from above. So as we look at it from above, what we're going to see is we're going to see a, a square here. That's the top part. So here's our top square, and that's our region. And then what we'd see underneath with our x-ray vision is we'd see these planes going down. Okay? There's our planes. And in fact, we can be a little bit more precise. We haven't been precise yet. Let's go ahead and be precise now. What's true? Well, what's true about x? Well, I'm, if I want z to be 2, when does z equal 2 and z equal 2x intersect? That's when I'm at x equals 1. And of course, if I'm at negative 2x, I intersect at negative 1. So this is a, a square. It's, it's actually side lengths are 2, 2 by 2 squares. Now, why do we not want dz, dy, dx? Well, the thing is, suppose I were to pick a point over here. Now that would be, say, roughly there. If I were to go up and down, what would happen is I would hit this face. Whoops. Oh, sorry. I put the point there. Ah! It's hard to translate sometimes. I'll be hitting that face. But if I pick, say, a point over here, and I go down, then I'm going to hit a different face. See, the, the faces change. So there's four different faces that are the bounding faces below. And so if we integrate with respect to z up and down, we'd have to do it four different times. One for each time we have a different bounding face. So this is bad because there'd be four integrals. And four sounds like four times as much work. And our goal is to do just the right amount of work. The right amount is usually as little as possible. So, we're not doing that. All right. 
Well, probably we should talk about our time about what we are doing. So we're integrating over our solid S, our density, dV. That's our mass. That's our basic formula. So we're going to do an integral, integral, integral. 9 plus arctangent x to the fifth y squared z. And then following the hint, dx, dy, dz. Now, let's, uh, let's do what the hint tells us. It says, integrating with respect to x last, so we should look down the x-axis. And when we look down the x-axis, we're going to be looking in the yz plane. So what do we see? Well, what we see in the yz plane, it's actually very similar to what we saw in the xz plane. We see this sort of upward shape here, and we look like that. So that's our shape as we look down in the yz plane. Now, what do we know? Well, we know that this top line right here, this is z equals 2. This side, that's y equals, uh, sorry, z equals 2y. And this other side is z equals minus 2y. All right. Now, notice how we're set up. First, we're going with respect to z. Where does z go between? Well, the answer, the lowest z value is at the bottom, 0. Highest is at the top, 2. 0 up to 2. Next, now I, I'm at a particular z. I'm integrating with respect to y. So I'm at a z, and I'm changing y. So that says I'm doing this right here in the picture. So I need to write y in terms of z. So if I do that, well here, if I write y in terms of z, that would be y equals minus one-half z. Two, y equals plus one-half z. All right, well that's good. Now we go to our picture, three-dimensional picture. And what do we know? Well, we're integrating with respect to x. So that means I want to move parallel to the x direction. So I'm going to be moving back and forth. Because there's three directions. There's up and down, that's z. Left, right is y. Back and forth is x. So I'm moving back and forth. So I'm going to move between this back surface here and this front surface here. Now what are those surfaces? Well, the back surface, that's z equals minus 2x, and the front surface is z equals plus 2x. So what are my bounds? Well, I need to solve for x. So solving for x, we'd say our back is minus 1 half z, and our front is plus 1 half z. And there we go. Now in some sense, you can kind of see that the bounds actually work in sort of an intuitive way. Because if you think about what the bounds are doing, it looks kind of like a square. So minus a half z to a half z, minus a half z to a half z. And it's just as z goes up, at the very bottom, it's a 0 by 0 square. By the time you hit z equals 2, you're going, you know, one positive and one negative in, in both directions. Okay. Now, you say, all right, well, that was great for the bounds. But now, if we're integrating with respect to x, ugh, what a headache. We've got to integrate this. Well, notice, of course, the y squared z, that's a constant, so that really comes out. And now we say, okay, we're integrating 9 plus arctangent of x to the fifth from minus 1 half z to plus 1 half z. What is that going to be? Well, the 9, that's great. We love 9. 9 is a nice number. 9 is the kind of number we'd take to meet our family. But this arctangent of x to the fifth, what a strange function to do. A peculiar function, unusual, weird. Some people might even say that this function is odd. Now you're probably thinking, yeah, it does look very weird. But no, no, odd has symmetry. See, the arctangent of x to the fifth, I would have a hard time integrating that. You, you're young, you might do better than me. 
But, you know, it's doing something like that, roughly speaking. And because we're going from plus one-half z to minus one-half z, I don't know what z is, doesn't matter. What will happen is that these two pieces cancel out. So, because of symmetry, this part goes to zero. So there was actually an advantage to integrating with x early in that we were able to get rid of something very soon. So, what do we have? Well, this is really just the integral of 9, because this other part integrates to 0. So, we get that this is 0 to 2, negative 1 half z to positive 1 half z, and then, when we integrate, we're going to get 9x. 9 9x 9 from x Oh, and don't forget there's also a y squared z. Ah, uh, y squared z. Okay, we'll put it all there. Okay, it's all there now. Uh, from x equals minus one-half z to x equals plus one-half z. And then we're going to write dy dz. Now when you plug this in, you're going to get nine-half z minus nine-half z, which means that this whole contribution here is equal to nine z. So we're at the integral from zero to two integral minus one-half z to plus one-half z of 9 y squared z squared, because there's a z and a z. Okay, dy dz. So that is integral 0 to 2. Integrate with respect to y. Well, here, we integrate y squared, we're going to get y cubed, but then we're going to divide by 3. So that is going to become uh, 3y cubed. And then we're going to have a z squared. And evaluate y equals minus 1 half z to y equals plus 1 half z dz. All right, well, 0 to 2. Plug it in. We're going to get 3 eighths, because a half cubed is an eighth, and there's a 3, so 3 eighths, there's a z cubed, and there's a z squared. So that's 3 eighths z to the fifth, right? 3 plus 2. Then we're going to subtract. Here, when we plug in, we're going to get negative 3 eighths. Minus minus makes it plus 3 eighths. But again, we're going to have z cubed and z squared, z to the fifth. So, that becomes... Integral from 0 to 2, 3 eighths plus 3 eighths makes 3 fourths, z to the 6, sorry, 5th power. All right, good. Now you integrate that. If you integrate z to the 5th, well, you're going to get z to the 6th. So, working our way back up where we have space left on the page, we get 3 fourths times 1 6 times z to the 6th. Evaluate from 0 to 2. And I don't put z equals just because we're down to one variable, so there's no confusion. You could. Nothing wrong with it. If you plug in 0, you get 0. Well, that's good. That means we just have to plug in 2. So what do we have? We get 3 fourths times 1 six times 2 to the 6. Well, but let's simplify. 3 goes into 6. That leaves us with the 2. So that leaves us downstairs with 8. 4 times 2. Upstairs, we have 2 to the 6, which is 64. 64 divided by 8 says that we're going to be left with a grand total of 8. Now, you might say, 8 what? Well, they didn't give us any units. So just 8. 8 of whatever it turns out to be. And that's a, an example for three dimensions. And, uh, of course, that's as many dimensions as we go into. So, great place for us to stop. And we'll continue again next time. Good.